Um, and this first slide is sort of like when you, I don't know how many, how many of you try to explain what Ethereum is to like your friends and family, and it's like, how do you, what is this thing? What, how, what are the words that I use? And so this this slide is some of the words that I've tried to use to try to explain what this thing is. So a lot of people I find have this idea of what Bitcoin is, or at least they have sort of the, the idea it's, it's geek money, it's money from the internet, something like that. Um, so that can be a useful place to start, right? You know, so have you ever heard of Bitcoin? Well, it's kind of like that, except way better, right? It, it, 2.0, if, if Bitcoin was a pocket calculator, then Ethereum is like the piece. Then they're like, okay, well, what does that mean, right? Um, so I also have some, some uh, friends that are uh, lawyers. And I've heard Gavin Wood, who is one of the founders, uh, often use this term kind of crypto law. Well, well, what does that mean, kind of? But if, if Ethereum is these, we have this idea of a smart contract, these bits of code that can automatically execute any given instructions, you can agree upon two different things. Uh, we have that right now in our society, we call that the law. And we uphold that with those huge institutions, huge buildings, and things like that, courts and professionals. Well, what if all of that was sort of redundant and not necessary? That's the idea behind crypto law, that you could enter into an agreement with any other party, write it down in code, publish it, and be pretty confident that once that thing is going to happen, like there's nothing any of you can do to stop it. Right? So, so, so some people that have that, that makes good sense, and think, okay, well, that, okay, that, well, how does that actually come about, right? Um, and you can get into like sort of like blockchain stuff and some of the technical details with the hashing function and all that other kind of stuff. But I think you know when you're talking about Ethereum, it's kind of like this global computer, right? And that's different from anything that we've ever seen before because there's just one of them. Um, it's everywhere and it's nowhere at any given time. The way it runs, right? It's just you you run it and there's. A, essentially, right, an algorithm that runs that makes sure that everybody else who executes the same code comes to the same arrangement, and that happens everywhere. Um, last thing, I, I've been really kind of noodling around this idea of a computing commons, and what that means is, like, for, for a global computer, that has some interesting properties. You can even consider that, like, okay, well, that's like the cloud, right? Everybody kind of knows what the cloud is. You maybe use Gmail or something else like that, um, but that's still kind of proprietary. So this global computer might not be, uh, it could have been a private or it could have been open. And what we ended up with is something that's actually open, it's available for anybody to use, and therefore it's a general resource. And I think that actually could be more powerful than just the fact that it's a global computer or that anybody can use it or anybody can access it, that everybody can use what everybody else is doing and then take it one step further. It's sort of like the open source thing, just to end completely to the next level. Okay, so I was talking with Ryan earlier about how things move fast. And I mean, from the time when Vitalik put out the white paper, I mean, we're basically two years from that point, right? So the crowd sale came seven or eight months after that, about a year after that, we launch. And then now, we're about, since October is when DevCon won. Did anybody get a chance to look at some of those videos before they got stripped out? Not to, yeah. So there's some really great content there, and they're starting to come back on. So if you haven't watched those, I highly recommend going back and checking those out. So a lot of the projects that have been being proposed so far, they've got presentations on uh, the DevCon 1 video series, essentially. And they're coming out slowly. So if you uh, take a look at um, do a search for it, you'll probably find it. Yeah, they got taken down because of um, the, the music playing in the background was copyrighted. Oh. <laughs> like how ironic is that? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, this is one of my favorite screenshots I've ever done. So uh, when Ethereum first launched, I mean, this is what it looked like, right? This is the cooling period between when it actually first launched, and you can see the block heights running up and right down there. So you see it block. 46147. That's when the very first transaction came over live on the uh, through the network. And I, I happened to be sitting at my couch with this computer just on a Wednesday afternoon. And I, and I, and I just knew that what I was looking at was that's history right there. I took a screen grab of this and then I put it up on IPFS. So it's perfect. But I mean, that's pretty technical, right? You're not, that doesn't look revolutionary to most people. 
but it really is because of what's going on underneath. But it didn't take long before we had something that more looked like this. Right? So now we, we, we do things, we can have these nice wallets, we can send ether around, you can create contracts pretty darn easily, just right up in the pump, paste some code in right there. Um, you know, I'm not a developer, but I was able to do some of those really cool contracts that you see around here, like creating your own currency. It took me 15 minutes to do. I think that's pretty powerful. Okay. okay. So I just put together some quick stats about kind of like the size of the network at this point. Um, GitHub mentions about, well, compared to Bitcoin, right? So it's about 10 times bigger. Then when you go to the Reddit, how many people are on the subreddits, that sort of thing? About 24 times. Then you go to things like market cap, 91 times. And if you just go into Google, just do those searches, then you get something like you know, 93 million hits for Bitcoin and something like 500,000. That's pretty rough, right? But if you average all of those multipliers, you get something like 30 times-ish. Right? So Bitcoin, if Bitcoin is a thing, and if, however you can quantify it, it might be about 20 to 30 times bigger than whatever Ethereum is at the moment. But we're moving fast, and I think this is probably, we're not too far away from these things getting much closer to parity, but I don't know that we anybody really knows when that's going to happen, but we kind of have an idea of where we're at today. So, uh, from my perspective, I just, the last thing I wanted to go over as well, what is, what is it really good for? I think it's good for freedom, right? Like, what can we really do with this? Well, some of the first things, pretty, pretty basic, right? I think most people are going to see pretty clearly that it, there's a lot of financial pieces to this, right? You can send money to anyone in the world. It's nearly free. Uh, nobody can, really can control what you're doing with your, your funds. You can crowdfund a great idea in 20 or 30 minutes. You can create weird derivatives based on whatever the heck you think is interesting at the time and just kind of put it out there. Um, that's really free. You know, we don't really need permission to move our money around. We don't need permission to save it or you know, what we choose to use it for. I, I think that's pretty. And that, that gives more freedom to our life. Um, this is a screenshot from a project called Colony. If you guys haven't heard about Colony, it's pretty interesting. So what these guys are trying to do is um, make it so that with work, like you can work on anything, anywhere, to whatever extent that you think you can contribute. <coughs> and it's all based on blockchain, or built on top of blockchain, so that you can join a, a colony, you can participate, you can gain in reputation, you can continue to add value, and then you can get paid to do that. Like most people today, they go to one job, they do that one thing, and then they go home, right? And then they have to live in a very particular place to do it. And so if you get a new job, I might have to move someplace new, but what if I love Seattle? What if I don't really want to move to wherever the next job has to be? Maybe I could just figure out one thing that I'm good at and do that thing for lots of different things that are interesting and get like paid real money to do it. That's pretty cool. Um, <laughs> didn't you guys see this blog post? Right? Like this is part two. This is like a hundred lines of code and a better democracy. That's part two of this series. Like that in and of itself is pretty amazing, right? Like we could be building right now a new superstructure for the entire globe. Right? So if you think about the way our, our society and our structures, we've got like this idea of a core family unit, and then you maybe have a neighborhood, and then maybe some larger city group, and then you know it's getting bigger, maybe a state, like a, a nation state. What comes after the nation state, right? These tools that are being built today can add another layer of governance, but it's not a top-down governance, right? <clears throat> it's a peer-to-peer -peer model where we can organize ourselves. We can do the things that benefit each other and not you know, centralized power organizations. Where this ends up, I don't know, but 100 lines of code for a better democracy? That's pretty, that's pretty awesome. In fact, a, a quick story. Griff and I were just slacking it one night, and he's like, hey, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see if I can actually make this work. And it really was. It was like an hour dorking around on our laptops for two guys who don't know how to code, and we came up with a token and a proposal. Eventually, we got it passed, but... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right? it took a little bit. Yeah, it, it's pretty amazing. So where are we headed next? 
go to the moon. Yeah. Uh, so that's my talk. It's pretty short. And what I'm really excited actually now is to introduce Ryan. Um, and Ryan is a developer for Maker Project, uh, currently based in Portland, Oregon, right? Mm -hmm. So Ryan, uh, why don't you come up and give us an idea about what Maker is and what you've been doing there. So my name is Ryan Casey. I'm technically developer with Nexus, and our biggest project at the moment, or one of our bigger projects anyway, is uh, Maker. And I'm pretty excited about Maker. I actually bought MakerCoin before I start working on the project, and just kind of happened to get a get, I guess, brought on. So I'm here to talk about that today. Uh, first, to start with the summary, Maker Coin Maker is basically just a Cryptocurrency leverage platform and stablecoin, we call it DAI, and it of course runs on Ethereum. There are three primary parts to Maker. First is our decentralized governance model. Second is Keeper, and third is the most complex piece in my opinion, the collateralized debt decision engine. I'll be going through these in sequence. So first of all. Our decentralized governance model is pretty standard for this space. We have a governance token called MakerCoin. MakerCoin allows MakerCoin holders to vote on proposals, make decisions about what Maker does, and votes are weighted by the holdings so that what Maker does is in alignment with uh, the investments. So people who have a best uh, stake high stake in the future of Maker get to have a greater voice than what Maker does. But there's some risks that comes with this. Holdings get looted during debt crises, and I will get into that in more detail later on. And with that risk comes an reward every week, eventually, once this is all open and running, we'll have uh, buying rooms where Maker will take money out of its profit reserves and buy back Maker coin from holders who want to sell, and then that Maker coin will be earned, which will reduce the overall supply and drive up the value of Maker coin for people who decide to continue holding. And then we've been distributing Maker coin via crowd sale. We've sold a couple batteries on our phones already, and the payments to Dynasty, which are basically just people and groups that we hire to be working for Maker. And our com channels for successful proposals uh, is our forum at maker.com. We have a Slack also at makerdow.slack.com. And every week on TC, we have calls for Maker members. All right, so that's first piece. The second piece is Keeper. Keeper is at present just a Docker image that contains a bunch of services. Uh, at present, not actually many services. This goes here. Yes, I'm here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it uh, it contains programs that provide services to DAOs in return for compensation. So, eventually, we want to put this on Raspberry Pi and sell it to make it really easy for people to start providing services to DAOs like Maker, uh, but for now it's just a Docker image. And as I mentioned, it maintains Maker and other DAOs. In particular for Maker, it provides price feeds and margin calls. 
which I'll get into a little bit later. So it's essentially a meta mining. So it does all of these tasks that are important for maintaining consensus, keeping these DAOs, keeping the DAOs running, and it returns value for the people running it, which I also call keepers. So I don't know if you can do. You guys can follow me on that one. All right. The finalized debt position engine is, again, in my opinion, the most complex piece. So I'm going to spend a few slides going over this one. So first of all, we have DAI. And DAI is the stable coin in the maker system. When you want to have a stable coin, you basically have to uh, find a way to intelligently adjust supply in order to demand so the price stable and be stable. Either let the price float or you let the supply float, let the supply change. And there have been a couple of approaches to this in the past already. One of them is to basically have a centralized entity that holds assets and then puts tokens representing those assets on the blockchain. This is this works kind of because it you essentially have an asset backed token, but there are risks associated with that. If there's mismanagement or malfeasance, then obviously all those tokens can become worthless. Also it creates a nice target for governments to attack if they so choose. Another model that's close to what Maker does uh, is one that basically Mubis uses, where you have a governance token and you have people vote on adjusting the supply of the stable coin, uh, and then things get burned or issued based on the shareholder vote. So Maker tries to take that model and essentially distribute it. So there's not it's not just a handful of in this case it would be Maker coin holders voting on issuance or burning, there's actually a mechanism that incentivizes anonymous, untrusted, distributed actors to create and destroy DAI in relation to demand so that the peg stays where it should be, which is pegged to the SDR, the International Monetary Fund's Special Drawing Rights. So basically the SDR, if you haven't heard of it before, is a global bas basket of global currencies that is adjusted every five years based on how much global trade is being done in each of the member currencies. Initially, we had thought to peg DAI to the US dollar. We call it the dollar project. But given the international nature of, of Ethereum, and also given the fact that the SDR potentially is more stable than any single national currency, uh, we decided to go with the SDR for Nash. If the SDR becomes unstable, we could potentially decide to pay to say that's the currency. But the SDR that we're paying, so this is what this presentation will be about. And this peg is supported by collateralized debt positions. So collateralized debt positions are essentially smart contracts on the blockchain that lock up a certain amount of cryptocurrency and give a lesser amount of dying out. So you put in 150% or more in die value in some cryptocurrency, you get out 100%. So I put in 150 die worth of Bitcoin, I get out 100 die. And then if I put back the initial 100 die, I get back my collateral from that collateralized set position. This is how die is issued and burned. When I open up the collateralized set position, I literally create that die. And when I put the die back into the collateralized set position, to get back my collateral, that destroys that die. Now, if you're not interested in a stable point in particular, this is actually a good way to do trustless leverage walks. If you are really excited about either Ether or BitShares or Bitcoin, for example, and you think it's going to go to the moon, and you want to increase your exposure to whatever cryptocurrency you're interested in, you don't have to worry about die at all, basically. You, know, you can use this mechanism to increase your exposure. I'll show you how to do that in the next slide. There is a 2% APR. So if I open up a collateralized step position that gives me 100 die and I leave it open for a year, I have to provide 102 die to close that position and get my collateral back. The really interesting thing that makes this all work is that other people can close my collateralized that position as well. But from 125% collateralization on up, there's a penalty 
for them to do that. They have to pay a premium on the underlying collateral, and any collateral left over after they close out existing goes back to me. From 125% to 100% collateralization, there's a discount with peak and profit at 120%, which is illustrated in this chart. This chart comes from the white paper, so if you can't read it right now, it's tiny on that the whiteboard there. Um, you know, look it up later. I'm going to be looking at the end of the presentation. But you can see this green wedge here is uh, profitability from 125% on up. You see, well, you can't catch the things, but at around 150%, uh, there is a 5% premium you have to pay. So if I were to close out that collateralized debt position, I would get 95% of the underlying collateral and the remaining 5% would go back to the principal debt. And then from 125% to 100%, we have where I can make my profit, let's speak at 120%. So at 120% collateralization, I can just close out the collateralized debt position and take all of the underlying collateral. So concretely, Let's say we have a user named Who. Who's really excited about Bitcoin and wants to go long. Who puts in 150 dies worth of Bitcoin and gets out 100 die. And then Who turns around and sells that die for more Bitcoin. This leaves Who with 250 dies worth of exported Bitcoin backed by 150 dies worth of actual Bitcoin. So this is essentially a leverage long term. Now there are a couple of ways that this can go with Who. First of all, Bitcoin goes to the moon, let's say. Bitcoin doubles against the SDR. Who can then sell the Bitcoin for DAI, which holds out the TDP, get that underlying file, and then end up with 33% more Bitcoin than the Neanderthals. They also could have increased their exposure if they wanted to. They could have opened up more collateralized acquisitions. They chose to do that would increase their exposure. They could have also reduced their exposure by collateralizing their debt position at a higher rate. So, 100% five percent collateralization instead of 100% collateralization, uh, they would have had less leverage. Of course, trades can go the other way too. If Bitcoin declines by 20% against the SDR, then well, let's say we have another actor called FAR, or a keeper. A decline of 20% against the SDR would leave Who's CP at 120% collateralization. Okay? That's the peak profitability for FAR, so FAR closes out that CP, instantly claims 20% profit, and in the process provides the price support for DAI since FAR has to go out. It's in die, and then closing out that final step, which destroys that, that. And then who ends up with 33% less than Bitcoin? Although, I have to point out that realistically, Bar probably would have settled for less since Bar being the PK against all the other people running fewer. But for the sake of this, 20%. Now, Bitcoin can really, really go to the court. Let's say that Bitcoin. Its own and nobody wants it. The value of Bitcoin goes to zero. Well, far does it make money? Because nobody wants it, but once that end of my collateral, who loses 100% of the value and then they default the by the set position because they have no reason to close it. This leaves DAI under collateralized. In that case, Maker has to bail out the debt positions using DAI and its reserves. So that 2% APR goes into this DAI reserve. And then, in the case of this sort of thing happening, it starts scaling out those collateral definitions and closes them out. What if the reserves are out though? Well, this brings us back to Maker. So, if you remember, the reward for holding Maker Coin is that you get to participate in these weekly buying orders. But the risk is that if the reserves are out, Maker starts issuing new Maker Coin in exchange for that. And it uses that die to close out the finalized set positions. It keeps issuing more maker coin until all the finalized set positions have been closed out. So normally, maker coin is subject to steady to 
inflationary pressure, but in the event of a debt crisis that punishes makers' reserves, it becomes subject to inflationary pressure. And that's the risk of the money. Again, completely, the Fed is maintained. If Dai appreciates against the SDR, then Bar can buy Dai, start closing out CDPs. This works because the collateralized debt position makes the assumption that Dai is worth one SDR. So if value of Dai starts falling against the SDR, then that increases the collateralization percentage, which is profitable to, clo to close out, essentially. So uh, to take our previous example of a 95 of a 150% collateralized debt position has a 5% premium associated with it. If DAI falls against SDR by 6%, that's a 1% difference that are than in harvest. Okay? So that's that's how it works out. And of course, buying DAI closing out CPs reduces the supply of DAI and increases demand, which drives it back up to the bank. Now, if DAI appreciates against the SDR, well, or can either sell DAI and buy back or who can make the zoos. Or, buyer can sell DAI and issue more. Either one will increase the need for circulating supply and drive the price back down toward the value of the SDR. Now, I might have picked up that the tightness of that peg is entirely dependent on tightness of the markets that keepers are willing to accept. And while we're going to try and make it as easy as possible, specific as a keeper by pushing out Raspberry Pis and Docker images, uh, there's still probably some things that you can, will be able to do, or will eventually do, to give themselves an advantage over other people running keeper. A couple of things off the top of my head from the other day. First of all, obviously watching the ratio of die value, of die value to SDR value, if that break breaks, there's probably a problem in the somewhere fixing it. Uh, CDP collateralization percentages in terms of die, just as I mentioned earlier, because the CDP engine assumes that one die is worth one SDR, a falling, a falling die price increases the collateralization percentage that's profitable. And then the ratios of trading currency values to SDR, increase arbitrage, paths that potentially can take advantage of. Ratio of reserve to outstanding debt. This is an indicator for the existential risk of make a maker. Basically, uh, how well a maker can weather a debt crisis before it has to start inflating maker coin. And then finally, also the volatility of debt. So, maker has very, very high collateralization percentage requirements, but it's still possible to get the wrong end. So, if I claim 120% and then the collateral is like Bitcoin or something, that variable, that value variable evaporate before I have a chance to convert that to my preferred So keeping that in mind can also be So to recap, maker holders govern maker based on their holdings. They also assume the risk that this debt crisis indirectly they assume it. And they also get the reward of being able to Participate by inference. Keepers maintain DAOs like they can fund profit and compete with each other to provide the services, to thus provide services for DAOs and profit from that. And then the finalized acquisition engine helps maintain the Fed by buying incentives among the economists to the actors to drive the value of DAO constantly back toward the Fed. The website for Maker is makerdown.com. That's where you can access the forums. And you can also access White Maker. We also have some code up at github.com slash makerdown. Nexus <coughs> is up at nexus.us. Our code is at github.com slash nexus development. We have some Ethereum development tools that are fun to that I'm working on in particular. And I myself am available. As for IPDX, I on literally every service I signed up for, including Twitter. So if anyone has any questions after the meetup, uh, feel free to tweet at me and I will try to answer those. Uh, as of now, I will take questions.
I'm not sure if the so let me repeat your question. So the question that's asked and repeated, just to make sure. Sure, for sure. Um, hi. Uh, I have two questions. Sure. My first question is um, regarding keepers, how do they like get I guess like a bird's eye view of CDPs to close out? Like imagine a keeper just kind of like on its own computer. How does it know? Where any given CDP is to close out a problem. So, is it making the request a smart contract? Uh, there will be a smart contract that it makes requests to you. So, is it like paying for information? Sorry, I'm supposed to repeat the question. Uh, <laughs> uh, sorry, the, the question was uh, the question was how does Keeper find out about uh, collateralized definitions that it can hold out? Yeah. Yeah, and it's basically just watching the blockchain and uh, interfacing with the smart contracts that you can use to open up the finalized applications. Okay. Yeah. So if you watch the blockchain for free without having to actually like yeah, you, request or competition. Yes, right. you can watch the blockchain for free, get data off of it without having to, to get anything mm -hmm. on the blockchain. And then my other question was, um, is CDP something that can be transferred since there's like a benefit in owning it? So we have to close it out for a premium? So uh, we don't plan on having any sort of functionality native, but you could probably figure out a workaround. Okay. Uh, I mean, obviously, the, the really easy way would be to transfer it by the key. Right. You know, or have a contract holding C, that would be C, for example. Yeah. So, you know, okay. we're not planning on making it easy, but there's always a way to make it happen. Right. But, like, is that, I guess, I'm not really familiar with lots of finance ideas. Is that like a potential for a, um, so uh, is that like a potential for like a market? I guess like you see these kind of like value that is somewhat separate from Guy and Everybot. Is that just the end kind of magic? Yeah, uh, so, so the question was uh, about the transferability of CDPs. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, that would create a market, in my opinion. I don't know much about finance either, but anytime you have some sort of transferable thing of value, that creates a market. Yeah. There's going to be a market around that. So. Okay. They get a market out of the coins that were stuck in cops. So I yeah. yeah. that they should get a market yeah. out of CDPs. Right, coins stuck at cops and didn't, uh, you know, Ultima Gold and. Um, yeah. 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 Neopets accounts. <laughs> everything, everything. Yeah. So if I'm interested in stable coins and I want to just hold them because I just want my money in crypto. Yeah. But they can be canceled at any time. Can I have any assurance that my die will stay there? Or what happens if somebody else if I if I find die if I don't have any underlying file or is that required? So the question is is uh, underlying collateral a requirement for buying die? Or holding? For holding die, for holding die, there's you don't have to have a collateralized deposition open to hold die. And will that die ever disappear if the underlying collaterals? Your your die that sorry the question again was uh, will that die disappear at any point? Uh, the die that you hold won't disappear out from under you. Die gets destroyed only when someone explicitly sends it to a collateralized deposition in order to close it out. Sorry, I didn't know that you could hold a, like Bitcoin on the Darren blockchain yet. Yeah. Uh, the, yeah, the question was, or rather the statement was that you didn't know that uh, you can hold Bitcoin on the Ethereum blockchain. Yeah, there's a uh, thing called BTC Relay, which is actually uh, an SPV client. Um, so basically, it can verify that a transaction was actually made on the Bitcoin blockchain from the Ethereum blockchain. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that was easy. <laughs> yeah. Well, like for the contract, if you're, you know, essentially getting more Bitcoin that was literally maybe put into the contract, I guess. Where is that coming from? How does that? Is that? I guess I'm a little confused there. Like, how you're able to? If I'm trying to make it wrong somewhere. Sorry. Mind, but, um, getting more Bitcoin essentially than what was actually put in. Maybe. Oh, um, are you asking about the uh, the premium, the premium and the, the discount? 
Eric's going to ask me about like uh, getting more. If you want to go long. Yes. Yeah, you're going long. Like someone's paying. Oh, sure, sure, sure. Uh, yeah. How does going long and on Bitcoin work? That's the question you're asking. Yeah. I guess it's, yes. Okay. Uh, yeah. I mean, the extra, the extra Bitcoin would have to come from someone. Uh, I mean, that second step uh, when Fu sold the die that they just issued uh, in order to get more Bitcoin, someone had to be willing to sell Bitcoin for die for that to happen. So, and, and then of course they have access to the underlying collateral just by you know, buying more die to close that out, and then the difference because of the, the price rise, right, uh, gives them an additional 33 percent than they just, above what they started out with. So, yeah. I don't know. I would BTC really like, and probably no more than me. Uh, do you know if you can like uh, initiate a transaction on a Bitcoin blockchain from BTC really? Uh, or is it just is it like just read only of the blockchain? As far as I know, it's just read only. Okay. So there's no way to do Bitcoin stuff from a smart contract right now. Right. You can yeah, you can see that something's happened on the Bitcoin blockchain that you okay. can't uh, initiate things. As far as I know, I, I could be wrong about that. I don't know much about the BTC relay one, but they're working on a Doge. Uh, they're trying to get a script to work on Ethereum. Yeah. I and, know. Yeah, so they're going to create Ethereum Doge, and when they burn Doge, and so a native domain native token that represents Doge. And so you could do that yeah. with Bitcoin. You know, yeah. I don't know why they're starting with Doge, but why not? Yeah, that's <laughs> they will like the rules there. Doge client in Ethereum. Mm -hmm. That's cool. That's what we need. <laughs> <laughs> Be cool. I don't know. So with, uh, with these contracts, are these tokens, the Maker token and the DAO token, when you send that, you're going to need to pay gas and there are Ethereum tokens? Yeah, there are Ethereum tokens. You'll have to pay gas to do transactions. Is there any exchange that people would be able to use off? Like kind of, kind of like how with CRIPC or what's why I say CRIPC, but the BTC or any of these other exchanges, Kind of have off uh, off blockchain transactions. Could you do that with a DAI or a uh, So, so the question, as I understand, as I understood it, was uh, will there be an off blockchain market for DAI? Uh, there, yeah, there will be an off time an off chain market for DAIs. I imagine if the, if the exchanges will have us, uh, it'll implement the token. Uh, we'll implement the token standard, so anywhere you can use a token, you'll be able to use DAI. Uh, you could potentially pay gas. Costs and die with this actual with this coming up uh, abstraction with Serenity, right? Because with Serenity, you can potentially then pay whatever token you want uh, for, for execution. So, yeah. So I guess actually that that doubles back on my previous answer about the having to have gas. Um, you have to have gas. It doesn't have to necessarily be either though. Uh, once we have Seren once Serenity is out, yeah. I might have missed something, but so you work for Nexus, but that's not connected to Maker. It's, You're it's, building something on top of Maker, and that's what you want. It's connected. So uh, Nexus started out actually just as basically developers of Maker, mm -hmm. uh, and then we sort of spun off uh, so we could pursue other things and bring in uh, additional capital essentially. And um, that's uh, that's roughly what happened. So we started as as Maker, we spawned. Okay, so yeah. the die is um, a part of it. Like the yes. that, that's all the one thing. Because yeah. The reason why you separate was so you could develop it more. Yeah. Okay. Basically. Uh, it seemed like a good strategic decision at the time. So, uh, yeah, it's worked out pretty well so far anyway. Where are we in the current stage of development? Current stage of development? So, Nikolai could probably answer this question. Sorry, the question was, where are we at, currently in development? Nikolai could probably answer the question better than I could, since he is uh, most hands-on with the smart contracts themselves. Uh, mostly, I'm building the, the tooling around it. Uh, Dapple is what I've been spending most of my time around in. Um, so, but uh, I think we're looking to have something a little bit soon. 
you know, the full blown thing isn't going to be soon, I think, but I don't know. It's I can't answer that question very well, to be honest. Uh, I know that we're, we're close to having liquidity at least of, of major flying, so yeah, that's about it as far as I know. How are you guys raising capital? Uh, we're raising capital through uh, selling MakerCoin, basically. So we've, uh, what was it? There were a million MakerCoins, and we've sold about half at this point. Um, we've been selling them in batches and giving them as compensation to uh, to people who do work for us. Um, I myself, again, uh, hold a large number of MakerCoin, um, some of which I received as compensation, some of which I bought. So. Uh, that's a, uh, yeah. So was there a crowd sale or is this like It's sort of an, on, yeah, it's sort of an ongoing process. Uh, there wasn't this one big crowd sale. Uh, so if you go to the forums, you can see where we've sold batches in the past. And uh, if you want to buy, um, you basically post there. And it's very informal. <laughs> um, yeah. Is there been allowed to buy? Uh, there have been in the past. Uh, on the, the crowd sales. Uh, it's been different for each batch, though, so I haven't come up with it. Yeah. Okay. What's the value that they're cracking up these days? Like, uh, probably the last one. It's got like, arbitrary values. Yeah. So uh, the value that we decided to go with is uh, $3 per one. Three US dollars. Three US dollars. Yep. That's what I bought in at. Yeah. Get compensated ass. Right. Yep. Sticking with it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, what do you have to have to be able to query all these CDPs when you build up an idea of your every day? Food jobs and that many bars on this and push that. Yeah. So, the question was, how do you, how would one uh, build up a picture of the, uh, what do you have to have? Yeah, so what what you have to have to build up a picture of all the CDPs and, and what they're uh, backed by, is that what you want? I just want to know the state of the, you know, what's going on. Okay. Uh, yeah, basically just. Um, is it going to cost me? No, no, no. It won't cost you anything because all the data is on the blockchain. Um, yeah, I mean all the all the data is on the blockchain, so you're pulling the blockchain down. And you're watching that data that you, you're pulling down as part of the You look at your own copy of the blockchain, and then all that everything you don't have to set up requests or anything. Um, all the data is there. Uh, when you yeah, when you're when you're developing, I guess maybe that's when you're developing uh, smart or DAOs, I guess, or DAPs. Um, I mean, you do have to query Ethereum, but it's it's all, I mean, it's a, a gap or something, right? Uh, Ethereum economy. But when you do that, it's just looking at its own local database. Uh, it's not going out and asking for something. Maybe I understand. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's pretty hard to do it. Third time. All right. <laughs> Well, there you uh, right. yeah, we have plenty of time, about 45 minutes left of the room, and I, I did bring some snacks and stuff, so I guess I want to just kind of go around and talk. Uh, I did have one thing I wanted to say before we kind of up. So um, I also own some to make a point in the Hall and community, and I was actually able to arrange for everybody here to show up tonight and have one make a point. Now you are all uh, which is pretty not it. Oh, but what I need from you in order to claim that is an Ethereum address. So if there anyone here doesn't have an Ethereum address, uh, we can easily set that up. We can kind of go through you know, Dell computers here. You can probably do it on the way. Uh, otherwise, you can email me your public address, and I can see to it that it's one maker. And if you follow the project, you can see how it's going, and you can participate in tournaments if you want to. Right. Um, like uh, Ryan said right here, uh, you can go to the website and, and take a look at everything else that's going on. So thank you very much for coming. Good night.